Welcome, everybody, to the Unnormalized Podcast. This is your host, Frankie A., and today I'm joined with a super stellar guest. Um, I totally love a lot of the work that he's done. Um, today I have Miltos Uralimo with me, and we are going to talk about um, the life unnormalized and uh, a lot of the projects that he's been involved in, getting to know him as a person, um, and all that kind of fun stuff. So if you don't know who Miltos is, um, you're living under a rock, um, because he's been in some really great projects. The Danish Girl, The Crown, uh, The Boogeyman, um, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, which um, I'm such a Star Wars fanatic. Um, so to have you on is like really like freaking me out right now. Um, in addition to that, my probably second favorite fanatic superstar um, fan, if you will, Game of Thrones. So Miltos played Ciro, Ciro Farrell, who, um, well, we'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> so Miltos, um, I like to kind of just start off with my guests, um, you know, in my line of work. Um, I'm very intrigued by um, who a person is, all right, behind what we know superficially um, from what we see like on TV or, you know, just first impressions. Um, so why don't you tell us a little about who Miltos is, things like where you grew up, family background, things of that nature. Hello. Hello, Frankie. <laughs> um, so good to be finally talking to you after, I know. after us, our postponements, but it's so I good to be know. talking to you. No, it, it's, been, it's, been it's been a while in the making, so um, it is my pleasure, and, and I, uh, I'm really a fan of, of your work, so um again like i i love to just get to know who you are as a person um because i think as fans we kind of we don't get to see too much of that right so mm -hmm. um you know just tell us a little bit about the the viewers who you are um and where you come from and you know what makes miltos miltos so uh my parents are both greek cypriots and they came over to the uk um when i was uh when 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 my mum was was quite uh quite quite pregnant with me i think she was kind of due i think she was probably going to be due while she was on the boat they took a boat from uh cyprus to uh southampton um and uh, came to the uk emigrated to the uk my dad had been over working for his dad my granddad always working in restaurants as typical greeks so um so they came moved over here uh there was kind of some kind of plan i think uh it's kind of difficult to really get to the bottom of it that i was going to get born at sea Hmm. so that my parents could choose my nationality i think there's some my citizenship i think there's still some kind of weird loophole about about that at the moment if you get born at sea so um anyway i foiled her plans by being very very late um <laughs> i was really late and uh, i was born uh in the uk and that's where i grew up and uh my parents had a restaurant in the UK on the, on the south coast by the sea uh, for 25 years and then they took early retirement went home which is where they are now they have an olive grove they make olive oil that's kind of their their thing uh, that's kind of my background my I grew up in a very conservative uh, little sleepy uh, town in in England uh kind of never felt like i fitted in at all certainly not at school but acting was the thing at school that was my the thing that uh gave me a way into school because every, i was really not very happy at school at all but acting was my 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 lifeline and and that's kind of where it started and it continued uh i became obsessed by it um I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. I don't think I was very good, to be completely frank with you, but uh, it was a, it was, it really was a compelling for me. So, 
as a good Greek boy, I was going to go and do law at a university. <laughs> uh, but luckily there was an intervention before that happened. I'd made <laughs> my application and everything. And a good friend of mine went, Miltos, don't go to, to, to university to do law. Number one, you can't even pass an exam, let alone <laughs> go and study law. You're not at all academic. If you're going to go and try and uh, prove something to your parents or make them happy, at least go and do a degree that you're going to enjoy. And that's when I went and did a, a performing arts degree. And I met uh, some amazing people who are still fantastic friends to this day, who are wonderful actors and directors. And um, and I and and I got ex exposed to theatre that I've never ever seen before. Up until that point, I was very much I would do musicals, you know, the normal ones, you know, uh, West Side Story, Cabaret, you know, the the normal run of the mill stuff. So that was my experience of theatre until I got to university and I was exposed to some of the most avant-garde uh, theatre that I have ever seen. People suspended from the ceiling, soaring furniture in half. You know, I'm talking <laughs> stuff that <laughs> you don't quite understand. <laughs> but, but, but it was a, a really great three years and, I, and, I, and it exposed, exposed me to a lot of different uh, types of I mean, the idea of being a performer. So I've never really considered myself as an actor, um, whatever that means. I mean, uh, uh, we are collaborators. We we act and we find ways of telling stories. And sometimes that is being working for a company or under a director who will have a, such a clear idea. Uh, and other times when it's really collaborative and we all work together and we create something as a group so so all of those different things i find very exciting and um i'm i'm quite uh i suffer from nerves greatly and i feel like as i've got older it's got worse <laughs> i think when i was younger i didn't give uh, right you have thing. kind of you kind of have like like fearless. That reckless abandon yeah. fearless yeah. yeah and as i can i can totally identify like getting older some of those you kind of contemplate things maybe a little bit more than when you think things through as an adult that you probably just don't, you know, have that experience or uh, maturity that leads you to kind of think of consequences and, and, and kind of we're as adults, like our own worst critics, we hyper focus on everything we do. So I could totally appreciate you know that's exactly right right that's exactly right. how i feel about it yeah. right right and and i i love the fact that um that you had like there was a, I, i'm always interested about how people kind of come to like a crossroads right so you had this you know plan in your head about going to university and studying law and all that kind of stuff and were was introduced to uh, a form of expression um, that comes through acting that allowed probably you to tap into some things that, um, you know, I, you said that you kind of had, you know, we all have difficulties in, in um, grade school and growing up in school. Um, I think it's probably some of the most challenging times for an individual while they're kind of like developing themselves, getting to know each other, I mean, getting to know themselves. And uh, there is a lot of uh, barriers and challenges that kind of get thrown your way that maybe you don't have the tools and the capacity to kind of manage and maneuver through that. And um, I love how you said that um, you know, you were exposed to some of the more avant-garde stuff. Um, I'm kind of that guy, to to be honest with you, Miltos. I like, you know, the normal, um, I'm a big performing arts person. You ask me about a sport, I probably won't be able to hold a conversation, but um, a lot of, besides doing like social work work, um, a lot of my passion um, and experience comes from the performing arts field. Um, and I think that um, while the, you know, the traditional stuff um, is fantastic, I think that we get a lot more culture 
I guess is maybe, a, 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 for lack of a better term, through those avant-garde kind of out-of-the-box um, performance, uh, performing art stuff. Um, you know, I'm a big fan. Like, I'm very close to New York City, so... Well, Broadway is very tempting, all the big bright lights and, you know, all the, you know, well-known traditional um, theater that is there. I've always gravitated towards the more off-Broadway stuff um, just because I think it is refreshing. Um, it's a different way that we can look at humanity and creativity and culture and things of that nature so i do appreciate that whole avant-garde kind of of atmosphere and world so um it's awesome to see that you kind of had like the best of both um and probably what lends to you know you being a really great actor um how did what was like the first big thing that you kind of fell into or threw yourself into that kind of said hey like kind of validated that this is the path that was kind of destined for me to kind of go down rather than go down to university and you know force that law kind of plan for yourself so when I um, when I first started acting, I'd done the university. I'd found myself in um, so you know the you know you you mentioned the idea that I had a plan to go and do law at university. It was it was never a plan. <laughs> I was just reacting, reacting. to the fact that as a as a Greek son the my parents only greek son uh there was a, a a cultural responsibility that uh i needed to do the things that uh, i know that 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 my parents you know as as uneducated and without the 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 things that they could give me that they had because they were pe penniless when they came to the UK. They literally did have nothing. Um, and they were es escaping a civil war that they, that they um, wanted as, as the wonderful thing about Greek parents and many parents all over the world um, always want the, always want to use their lives to give their children something that they couldn't have, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, and and that is their ethos. That's their their reason to to exist, to be parents. I mean, it's mm -hmm. an amazing and very admirable thing. And I and uh, and I and I thank them for for having that ability because uh, me and my sister were hard work, I am sure, from time to time. <laughs> So, so for me, it was simply a, a feel, feeling of duty. But I didn't want to be a lawyer. I just felt like I, I should. Um, you know, uh, uh, my parents' ambitions are very limited. It's just to, to, you know, to to have a family and have security and just provide for your family. It's as simple as that. It's really as simple as that. And uh, I've always appreciated it, even though I have never, ever pursued it. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I was younger, I was very, very aware that I, 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 you know, I had incredible. I mean, I don't I'm not kind of particularly per a person who does things and without worrying about it. I worry about everything that that, that happens. I, I think deep down I, that there's a uh, there, there is great anxiety, even though. I think anyone who knows me would say that I'm very good at exuding uh, positivity and and you know and passion. Mm -hmm. But in my private moments, I I think I, I I and I think as we said earlier that as I've got older, I'm much more self-conscious about things. I think I think about things much more than I did when I was younger. Um, but the really interesting thing is is how it. It was just a reaction. It's it was just a reaction. I didn't want to upset my parents. Sure. Um, 
but but by embracing what I really really wanted to do of course I had to do that and you know at the end of the day you know my parents have come round it took them decades I'm not saying it was easy but uh, they came round and uh, and we've always had a really good relationship me and my parents they've never been the kind of parents who have stopped me doing anything it's just that my own my own sense of uh, duty was the thing that was getting in the way right but right. um but but um, but that's a very long winded way of just cor- correcting something you said. No, no, however, that's fine. Yeah. However, when 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 I did, uh, I, you know, I left college. I was really aimless. I I I'd done college, and then I realised, well, now I have to get a job as an actor. And of course, if anyone's ever tried to get a job as a, as a, an, as an actor, it's really really hard. You know, first of all, even finding out information about what is available is is virtually impossible unless you've got right. an agent, which I didn't right. have. So uh, I ended up looking in the in the in the in the back pages of a, a, a local of a, of a national paper called The Stage, which is allows people to um, uh, to to find work as an actor and. Um, I mean, we're talking about the the early '90s, so right. let, let, we've got internet now. But <laughs> that, I'm talking about pre-internet, right? Right. We actually have here, I, and I mean, you're probably familiar with backstage. Like that's our similar kind of of thing. right, right, right. Um, there's a lot of dodgy j- jobs in that. In that, uh, <laughs> if you're not fussy, it's a yeah. lot of work. But, but as far as legitimate acting is kind of few and far between. But anyway, I I was really lucky to fall in with this fantastic ragtag bunch of people who who had no money, uh, but were creating really fantastic theatre. Very physical, very influenced by DV8. DV8. British uh, performance dance dance company Lloyd Newson, and um, they were very influential on our work. And I worked with them. We didn't. We we every so often we got a hundred pounds here and a hundred pounds there, but we literally had no wages. We were all claiming unemployment benefit in the UK while we were working. I'm sure that's illegal, but <laughs> but we were we were we were we were, you know we were, we didn't have any money. I mean we were trying our best to to get by and, and make ends meet and um and that's where i got a lot of my training i trained a lot in dance uh, uh indirectly because i worked with some amazing choreographers and um and then i got a job or at least i, I got a job where i got an agent and one of the first jobs my agent asked me to go to uh, my agent was like um, Joey's agent in Friends, kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really true. Um, and uh, and and she said, "You've got an. Uh, they want to see you at the opera." And uh, I I do not read music at all. All right. So I I initially said, "I can't go. I'll humiliate myself. I don't know how to read music. I can't go to the. I can't do an audition for an opera." It's music, right? Um, and uh, she insisted, and I kept saying no. And I think this happened about three times. Uh, this is before mobile phones. Every time, as I'm thinking about this story I'm telling you, it makes me even remember that. I actually had to go into the centre of town, into a phone box to call her. <laughs> Nowadays, the that, idea of doing something like that is like right, mind-blowing, it's isn't it? foreign, foreign, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out of your mind go to a phone box so that's what I did to, to tell her no and um, anyway she persuaded me to go I didn't want to go and just at the point when I'd agreed to go to to the audition I didn't know anything about this job she just said they just want to see you and um, just at the point when I said I'd, all right I'll go they said oh uh, they want you to pick up some sheet music from the stage door. And I was like, no, no, no. Now they actually want to give me sheet music. What am I going to do with it? Wipe my ass with it? Maybe that's... Because I definitely can't read it. Right? And uh, and I and I and I was really crapping myself. Now it's like, why, 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 why don't I just stick to my guns? Just when I say no, why can't people just accept no for an answer? No for an answer. <laughs> so and there, I, I go to the audition, 
and it feels really old school you know you go and sit in the corridor and you wait and there's someone with a a, a, a kind of slightly out of tune piano you can hear people auditioning next door it's like <laughs> dusty you know creaky staircases <laughs> that kind of thing right yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and and eventually I get called in um and I, I obviously I get explained that it's for Midsummer Night's Dream Benjamin Britten's Midsummer Night's Dream uh, it's for understudying the role of Puck, but that's really all I know. And then they, I've never seen an opera as well, <clears throat> and I certainly don't know this opera. And and uh, the choreographer there, the assistant choreographer said, so Miltos, we want you to uh, improvise some movement to the line, um, I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door, which is what he says towards the end of the play to get rid of the fairies for the nuptials. And um, and I'm supposed to follow the music. So they play the music on the piano and I just listen to it and improvise some movement with a broomstick. And and that the, that's the kind of thing I can do, right? That's right, what I right. can do. You play mm. music, and I will. I mean, it may be ridiculous, but I will. I will give it a go. And um, and I got the job. And not only did I get the job, I went to rehearsals. This is the first big job. This is for the English National Opera, right? The wow. National Opera. Um, it was this really award-winning production of Midsummer Night's Dream by Robert Carson. They'd only created it, I think, four years before. It won all the awards. It was very groundbreaking because it won in one of the first operas that really got its actors to jump around and move around and fight and struggle. Because normally you just park a, an opera singer on stage and let them sing. This right. really was full of comedy and slapstick and... And that was really that was the new thing about it. Young actors really throwing themselves into it. And the guy playing um, uh, Park, who I was understudying, was this uh, guy in his 50s, kind of slight, grey, hangdog expression. He's the guy that if you remember a film, we're going back a long way, the tall guy with Jeff Goldblum and um, Emma Thompson Right, I am that I'm I'm that old, so yes, okay. I do. I do so know the it. guy who plays the stage manager, okay. who upstage, upstage rowing, uh, he's called Cypress Charlie in the film. <laughs> so funny, and uh, anyway, he's the guy I'm understudying. So I recognise him, and I'm going, oh my god, this man is a comedy genius. He's like brilliant. He's like he's like a. a a, 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 a mod a, our modern version of charlie chaplin that's how God, good he is, yeah right? mm -hmm. and um and so i'm understudying him so i'm watching a run through i've only been there one week right i've only been watching stuff i haven't really learned anything and they do a run and halfway through the run uh at one point uh park runs off the stage and literally leaps off the back of the stage which is very high but there's match there's crash mats so it, it's like a trick and um he does his back in he pulls he pulls a muscle in his back mm -hmm. and i have to do the very <laughs> first show and i only have a week to learn the part Nothing like crash course, right? <laughs> and that's what that was what I did. And so I got to do the very first product, the very first performance in the UK of this acclaimed opera. Barely know, I barely knew it. I didn't know it. I mean, I, I literally didn't know it. And I managed to get through it. And uh, it that was my baptism of fire. And that was pretty much when I realised that if i can do this <laughs> right 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 if i can handle this then maybe there is a reason why i am an actor so, right yeah. right i i mean that's a that's a great story and, and i do it to this day i do i do that opera to this day we, we revive it 20 years and on now we still revive it last time i did it i did it in uh, china really that's that's like phenomenal that just um, I love to hear when projects have sustainability like that because it opens up like, I mean, 
the course of the time you're doing it, it I mean, you're you're opening it up to different audiences, different generations that are exposed. Like you said, like I've worked for performing arts um, theaters before, and and I've been to operas, um, and it, that it sounds like something like that is like an unheard of in the opera in the opera world um doing a lot of that because like you said it is very um much so the person just you know we have sets and Pagliacci and stuff like that that kind of had some of that but this is a total different way of looking at opera um and i think um doing it and reviving it um for this long um just shows the sustainability of the work um and and do you still play the same part you do say i'm old enough see now i'm (laughs) old enough to play the part when i was first doing it they would have to gray up my hair and make me look Look old old. yeah um but now i'm actually old enough to play the part (laughs) (laughs) grown grown into it and that's like the interesting um, when I when I'm talking to people like yourself um, that there's almost like and it just doesn't deal with acting it's anything that you have like a passion for and why I kind of do this show is um, to show people that it's not just that doing like what your parents what you think your parents want you to do or what you think life is built up for you. Um, to do as a career or, um, you know, we sometimes don't think a lot of the passion that we have for other things besides like a nine to five job, the security. Um, and as a parent, I'm a, I'm a parent. I have an 18 year old son that's going off into the world. So I have to be mindful that, um, to put myself back into where he was, where where I was at his age. And um, some of those kind of trappings, Miltos, that I fell into, that could have made me walk down the road into more of a performing arts field. But I did exactly what you said, and that was, and I love my parents to death, but to do what they wanted me to do. And I have to look at my son's experience while I want security for him and I want him to be safe and I want him to have structure that that's my plan for him. It may not necessarily be his plan. So I love the talking to people about almost like a magnetic pull that I I kind of often say to people where your gut, your, your instincts are telling you that, this is where you're being pulled to. And I think that um, we don't, and maybe it's societal or, or what have you, that we don't feed that voice. We don't feed that um, that perspective to um, entertain it, to, um, like I say, feed it and to nurture it, to see where it goes. Um, and I think your story kind of gives us that, perspective of you know even in going for the opera you know midnight uh, midnight summer's dream to go and do this project that you didn't feel like you 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 know you were qualified for and then it winds right. and then it winds up being something that's sustained over like you know 20 years of, of revamping it and, and revitalizing it um that's like the message that i want people to hear from my guests um because a lot of people just don't see that or it's just not nurtured um we don't have you know in today's society a great um example and that's why i like to talk to people um because i want other people who are watching and listening to hear these experiences because it could be life-changing for people. Um, And I think that we run around and that's why the show is called a normalized podcast is because I want people to like normal. What I tell people in my day job is it's kind of like a, a fallacy. It's something that we always want. Um, or we're taught to want, but does it really exist, you know? And and it's doing things 
outside of what people tell you to do and and you know what society maybe built up for you um, to explore those avenues because a lot of the times Miltos it leads to success. So when you're happy and you're you're um, you know you you feel value and purpose in what you do, it always will lead to some type of level of success, um, big or small, big screen or you know in corporate or, you know, whatever you kind of want to um, explore for yourself, it's worth the exploration. And there's something to be said about that journey that you go down in exploring it. And not necessarily that you're going to be a one-off and it's going to work perfectly. Um, It's through the challenges and falling down and getting back up that we kind of learn these life skills and, 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 that um, help us kind of move forward in a path where we can feel like we're contributing um, and that, again, we have that value and that purpose. Um, So I I love that your story kind of um, talks about that and how you were able to feel a comfortability in a situation um, that m- was so totally foreign to you, but we're able to connect through your experience and working with um, movement and, and dance and it how how kind of like the stars aligned and that was what kind of got you through some of that anxiety and that process of like, what am I doing here? This is so totally out of my scope. Um, you know, and, and, and I think the, the the strangest thing about about I mean, it's interesting the way you put it, but we don't. It's it's kind of I I know I would just think to myself what I could have done with my life if it wasn't for the fact that I didn't get a chance to do some drama when I was nine years old at school, right or if I hadn't got another dose of it when I was 13 years old. Um, I, I, I think my life would be incredibly different. And I think every day about how all of us, you know, especially when we think how hard it is. I remember when I, when I left college and I'd graduated and I, was kind of depressed I didn't because I was I'd known what I wanted to do up until Lee you know finally finishing the course and then it was like well now the whole wide world is waiting and I have no idea where to start and uh, I I fell into a, a depression and I I was very I was aimless I ended up working as a grave digger in Melton Mowbray and um, I looked after a Polish grave with this very old, very strong man. <laughs> he was our foreman. And we would dig the graves and fill them in and look after the the graveyard. And uh, it really suited where I was, you know, how I right. felt. Right. And I did that for a few weeks. And then uh, I, I thought I'd pull my socks up and figure out one step at a time but I really believe that if it wasn't for the fact that I had something that I was genuinely passionate about that I actually had a uh, I don't I, to this day I still don't really know what it is that really draws me that makes me want to do what I want to do despite the fact that I have so many reservations about it like <laughs> fear of failure and all of those things and yet I want to you know I'm always happiest in my work when I'm challenged when I'm getting to I'm get asked to be to do something that is outside the box, that is outside my comfort zone. That's where I'm happy. Well, I wouldn't say I'm happiest, but it's where I feel more the most fulfilled. Right. Uh, and so it, it, it requires a certain degree of stress, which I could not tolerate in any other part of my life. Every other part of my life, I try and manage to, so it's completely stress-free. The only thing that is stressful <laughs> is the work I do. Right, right, everything, right. I, and I remove it from everything <laughs> else. But I, I just think about everyone who and wondering what they should be doing and if they are doing the wrong thing and I and I always think that if you're lucky you'll expose you'll get exposed or you'll come across something that will uh will 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 
turn you on. We'll, we'll just right. something will happen and you will you will only be able to think about that one thing. Right. And so I really hope people do have that opportunity. But obviously education has to nurture that too. And, and in so much in lots of education that I see everywhere all over the world, we kind of we're removing creativity from our from our education. And I think that's a real terrible thing. Right. We need right. more of it in. I think right. we need more edu- uh, more creativity in our education. I think it will means that um and then when listen and then when you're dealing with um uh, stressful when you're dealing with failure the reason why you do it again and it doesn't put you off is because you're doing something that you cannot help yourself but do right right it's that magnetic draw that kind of ignites something inside of you um and i like i've done a lot of things in my life um and and I can attest to it while while it's not acting, um, what I do every day um, is a it's almost far beyond what a paycheck could bring. It's like I it's a duty. It's a um, you know I often say sometimes to the people that I work with, I'm probably getting more from you than you're getting from me because it's the purpose why I wake up every day. And, um, you know, is it challenging? Yes. And I, I could totally identify with trying to minimize the stress in personal life um, because the work that we do, um, while it be in different, in different arenas, um, you know, it is um, probably the most stressful area of my life. And it's about m- kind of like, that balance, right, of, of you know, I love how you put it. It's like, even though it can be challenging, it's probably the most rewarding thing. Um, and it's getting through those barriers and those challenges in the stuff that you like to do. Um, it's not meant to shy you away from it. Um, the way I look at it, it's meant to, like, build on skills. And like you said, like, education. And for me, education comes in so many different facets um, that a person can receive information, skills, and build upon themselves. Um, and it, it's in that that helps you develop into that that role that you're meant to, for lack of a better, of a better term, to play in life, Right. Um, and you know, the insight that, you know, you give the viewers, um, a lot of the times I, I let my clients watch, um, some of these interviews because, um, it's very important for them to hear that uh, a person like yourself that, um, is successful in what they do still has reservations, still has anxiety, still has challenges, but it's how they process them and use that to maybe make the work that they do, um, more enriched. Um, so it's, it's, I, I often tell people who are in the creative world, um, like yourself that, you guys are like the storytellers for for us, right? Um, and and I think that's why we grasp so much to what you guys do is that oftentimes maybe we can't express it, um, but seeing somebody or connecting to it through music, through dance, through theater, through movies, it 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 it's awakening like a humanistic kind of thing that a lot of people can identify with um and 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 i love just how you you know your candidness in in how that is behind the scenes that we don't see um and 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 how um it really helps us connect to you the person um and 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 i really appreciate you kind of walking down that road with us um so how did you get into some of these like really super duper um i mean like i can't tell you again you've been in two of the things that are pretty much like a culture for me and that's star wars and game of thrones um 
So what is it like to be part of such cultural phenomenon like that? So I got into uh, Star Wars because of Game of Thrones, because of uh, Nina Gold, who is the casting director for both things. And I'd known Nina for a long time before Game of Thrones. She was one of those people that had seen me in a small theater above a pub, uh, uh, you know, many times doing a little tiny play. Uh, And when it came to casting Game of Thrones, of course, they wanted to see pretty much every English actor, British actor that um, that that was on offer (laughs) because it was going to be a big cast. So. So so that was the normal process of just, you know, going to do a screen test. Uh, And normally what happens is that you do the screen test and you forget about it. I mean, I can't tell you how many screen tests I've done for huge projects which have come to nothing. So you would it would be too painful to expend that much emotional energy worrying about every single one. So you don't worry about any of them. So what you do is you learn the lines, you do the best you can for the casting. Uh, And then you forget about it. You know, you just go, well, I'll never hear about that. And um, and that's what normally happens. But with Game of Thrones, what what happened was that they um, they called back after about two or three weeks and said uh, they had already given me uh, Lord Varys to read. And uh, they liked it, but they didn't think I was right for that part. And that's when they gave me Sirio Pharrell to read. And so I learned the very first lesson with Arya Stark. And I did three and a half minutes, that scene, all me talking. And I learnt it uh, and I did it about five times. And every time I did it, uh, it was the same thing over and over again. And uh, by the fifth time, I was like, ah, you know, who knows? But then when they said they wanted to meet me, when the Americans, HBO and David and Dan, the creative directors and writers, were going to come to London to actually meet face to face. That's when I crapped myself because I realised that (laughs) it was between me and Ben Kingsley or someone, someone, you know, but it was close. Right. It was I was I could get it or I could lose it. But it was that close. So that was terrifying. But, uh, you know, I just did what I did, you know, I mean, the part, the part, the point is that you may be shaking inside, but you just, you learn it so that you can just do it. You focus all your, all that, ner- all that nervous energy just goes into performing the character. And then that's how, that's how I've learned to harness it is just use it for, for raw energy. Energy, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's probably why I'm not a particularly subtle actor. But I, I would say that um, that's how I got that. Uh, Star Wars was simply I was on tour in America, actually, with a play. And uh, my agent phoned up saying that JJ wanted me to be in his new project. And I immediately knew what that was. And I was like, what? Like Star Wars? And then, yeah. They said with the, Nina had sent some tapes for some, uh, you know, some characters. He wanted some characters and he sent some tapes from Game of Thrones and went, have a look at these people that I've just been working with. And he was like, yeah, this one, this one, this one, and the curly one as well. <laughs> so, um, so so, so that's how that, that happened. And of course that was, I mean, you know, they always say it's who you know. And I have to right. say, Nina Gold has been has is like my angel. She has she has uh, uh, facilitated my career in ways that I don't have enough thanks to be able to give her. Well, while she opens the door, right? Um, I think um, that's part of it, and then um, it's it's just your genuine. Just from the forty five minutes that we've been talking, I mean, I can't see why anyone wouldn't like fall in love with you. To be honest with you, your personality is so comforting and so so warm. And you know, um, I often say that Sirio actually um, the character why I love so much is that he was the one that kind of built this. Um, 
confidence in Arya Stark that led to who she kind of developed to be, um, you know, I don't want to spoil it for people who are yeah. just who yeah. are just binge watching through quarantine um, Game of Thrones, but um, her character, the her character's character being built, um, kind of started with Serio um, in her trainings, um, and uh, and and I can I'm, I'm sure that even playing that role, a lot of the um, choreography and dance work um, that you had experience with lent to that because I know those type of scenes are um, so technically uh, choreographed. Um, So I often say that about the character, like without him, who would Arya Stark would have been, you know? Um, And, and, and that's why like watching it back, like you kind of, you know, watch it from a different perspective and take different parts of it. And that's a big reason why I wanted to reach out and speak to you. Um, and, and, and it's not just the role, but what intrigued me to um, get to know you as the person and an actor, um, because I saw that, you know, like one character's um, experience with another, the connection that kind of develops through the storyline. Um, and and it, it's, it's, where that person starts is where, you know, that's why I start every interview with who are you, you know, and where did you come from? Because it leads to what we're talking about now. And that's the, the success. Um, And, you know, not just in the world of acting, but, you know, I think that you bring a lot of insight um, and a human uh, approach to um, your work. Um, And it's, it's knowing for people that, you know, there are some challenges and, and, and it's the message that's coming through for me is that like, if you push through that, that um, there is a greater purpose beyond just that struggle. You know, we're not given things to just struggle because it's, it's not um, providing us some type of benefit. And um, I, I really think that um, this 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 interview kind of just tells that to people. Um, so, Miltos, before I let you go, because um, I could talk to you forever about um, <laughs> about things, and uh, I, I want to know like a couple of things. So, how as a an actor, um, somebody in this creative world, you know, we're dealing with quarantine and i know like the uk is kind of going back into some of that now um as an actor um or somebody in the creative arts how how do you kind of sustain that feeding that creativity um you know how is it affecting your world in the acting and, and creative arts um you know keeping that going during quarantine good it's a it's a very good question because it is the question that we are all asking ourselves and each other that 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 right now because it's so funny how we are all experiencing the same thing particularly in america and the uk uh i know other countries have done much better with uh you know reintroducing you know going to the theater and stuff like that so right um so initially uh i was stuck in a little studio with my partner in london which is where she lives and works uh i'm slightly outside london so i i um but because i was working in london i was one week into rehearsals when we got cancelled and we weren't sure what was going to happen i just thought i'm just going to stay me my little dog little louis um my little sausage dog and uh and and my partner sharing a tiny little studio in greenwich um for six months and it was fantastic and you know we 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 had an amazing you know considering we are living under a pandemic and right i'm i'm deeply deeply up can't quite believe what's happened i mean sometimes we it's so easy to get used to it and to become 
So uh, just take it for granted. But when you keep looking at the figures, keep looking, I'm watching CNN and that 208,000 for the um, for America, which is just just plastered. It's like that is that's bad. Right. And when you right. start to think about, you know, 5000 people a week are dying and you just can't. I, it really profoundly affects me that, and I and I've taken it incredibly serious this pandemic. Right. I right. have really taken it seriously. Um, I mean, it's easy when you have a your employers have just said no, you can't come to work because what else are you going to do? You're going to stay in. Right. What I've what I've found I've done is that I've um, I've done new things. For example, I've got much more into music making. Uh, I learned the. I learned the ukulele uh, in in the six months we were work we were we were stuck. Uh, I have a little setup right here, which is for kind of lo-fi, ambient, chill-out grooves, which I kind of noodle around with. I am I'm just learning, so I'm I would not consider myself able to do anything. I just press buttons and twiddle some knobs, and, right. you know, sample some things. And uh, I find that is an, an amazing thing. There's something I've always wanted to do, but never thought I had enough time. I've always wanted to be uh, to make music in own, obviously in a way that requires no technical skill. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, there are people who play violins. Right, I'm right, right. Just using pro, pro, a software and and a little bit of hardware that so you know I'm very aware of the limitations <laughs> but um but it is good for really um fueling and keeping me connected to my creativity and it's important we have to because that's the only way we we exist half the time right um, but I would like to also say that what it's also reminded me is 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 that we talk about creativity as if it's something to do with making music or make, making art or performing or, you know, but it doesn't have to be creative. Cre being creative is, is you can be creative on a walk in the park. Right. You can be creative right. walking your dog. You can be creative sitting by the sea and, you know, absorbing the moment. Do you know right. what I mean? Being right. creative is not it's it's not it's it's not as narrow as being a creator. Right. Being I love creative that. is something you can live every single day doing by appreciating the the environment that you're in. And right. if you appreciate it, you notice it. And sometimes if you notice it, it makes you reflect. And that's where you be, end up people writing poetry or painting or that but that's what that's what the amount of concentration that it takes is for us to is to just be you know I know I know it's a it's a luxury for most people they have to worry about do they have enough money to feed the kids do are the, you know are they getting the hours that that they need at work I understand that this is this is a luxury half the time but um but I'm a real believer that we have to always find the creative in everything that we do you know, the, 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 I, I, the ability to see it just to see it right right and i love that because um a lot of what i do um again in my my day job is i'm a mindfulness cognitive behavioral therapist so that basically is you just described it it's um me teaching people the skills to it's okay to be in the moment and it's okay to um, do those things to what we call for like self-care, um, whether it be medica meditation or walking in the park or, you know, um, free writing or whatever that looks like for you. Um, I have to tell you for full disclosure that um, for the people, uh, you know, that I work with, I, I pull things that they you know, do into my life, because if it's a practice that they do, um, it could provide me benefits and it allows me to open that as an extension to other people. So I have picked up things like knitting um, and the ukulele, which is funny that you say that, only because it was explained to me that it's probably the 
easiest instrument that you can learn and you can pick it up and play a song or two with five chords um, within like the first time that you pick it up. Yeah. So, and you don't um, even need to use six strings. You only have right, four. So it's, right, yeah, right, it's right, true. right. It's true. It's so, true. so it's things like that um, that you explained beautifully that um, situation like this in the pandemic, um, while it, it, it can be daunting and it is very, very serious, um, but I think it, it's it's a good opportunity for us to kind of like strip back all of the um, the trappings of life that we kind of put ourselves into and focus on ourselves and the human connection that we have with other people and um, those around us, you know, just appreciating time and, and having conversations that maybe we're too busy to have or experiences that we're too busy to have. And I love the fact that you, you tie it to that being creative for everybody, you know, and uh, is a great kind of mentality for, you know, for me to even um, kind of lend to the work that I do. Um, because even I'm thinking like creative, you know, and, and, and tying that to just what you said, like acting, music, painting, poetry, um, but it comes now in, in the way you described it in so many different avenues that we can apply to life. Um, and, and, and reap those benefits. So um, I really, Miltos, I really appreciate your time. Um, I think you're an awesome light that, you know, just talking to you, um, you know, across virtual pond <laughs> that, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that, you know, I appreciate um, what you kind of brought to my viewers that they can take away. Um, before I let you go, um, is there any projects or anything that you have coming up? I know it's kind of hard, you know, with things kind of slowly opening up or maybe pulling back, but are there any projects in the future that we can see and look out for? Um, you know, because I'm going to put all of your contact information um, in the description so people can kind of, you know, reach out to you, you know, and, and follow you on social media and things of that nature. Of so what kind of projects do you have possibly coming up down the pike? So a little bit into the future, as in next year, um, you'll be able to see me in the sequel to The Hitman's Bodyguard, which is what I think is called The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard this time around. Um, so that that we filmed that about a year ago maybe a little bit longer no actually o over a year ago because it was supposed to be out this year that film right okay. um but obviously it's been postponed so it can get some a, a, a theatrical release so that's exciting i try to kill samuel l jackson Doesn't really as well as i expected <laughs> as you can imagine um uh and i uh, i have had um I narrated a, an amazing novella by a, a Russian writer uh, about a month ago, and it's being serialized in a podcast, which I will, before I leave, send you the link to, uh, awesome. so that you can, you can, because I can't remember. But uh, it's, uh, he reached out to me, said, would you read the prologue? Ended up reading the whole thing. Uh, and it's been uh, adapted. I recorded it at home, you know, as right. best as I could and um, but it's a great story fantasy awesome. uh, intriguing surprising beautifully written really fantastic uh, fantastic writer definitely check it out awesome and my dulcet tones <laughs> so so definitely send me that information because I think it's something that we want to you know see eventually you get back into the swing of things and more projects um so everybody this has been the unnormalized podcast with miltos geralimo and frankie a um make sure that if you haven't seen it i mean i don't know why but check out <laughs> check out game of thrones it's it's something that if for something to binge it, it, it's it's a phenomenal show um 
Star Wars, The Force Awakens. I mean, we can go on and on with Miltos's is very stellar resume and body of work. But um, I'll put links to everywhere you can kind of check Miltos out. And everybody, get unnormalized. <laughs>